Jose Otero here with Per Schneider and special guest Mike Micah. And so we asked Mike to come on the show this week because Mike has an incredible collection of video games. Uh, and on top of that, he's a great dude. And so we asked, hey, why don't you bring three really cool things from the collection? You know, this, this <laughs> That you can carry. <laughs> that, that, you can, that was a thing, yeah. Yeah, wait, so there were things you couldn't carry, I could yeah, imagine. Yeah, there's probably a few of those. <laughs> do you have any giant Game Boy or anything? Like the, you couldn't bring the Donkey Kong you know, display I ones? I do or have anything. one of the Game Boy Color displays. It's a huge Because uh, right. I remember Toys R Us near our office was trying to ditch all that stuff, and I, I just grabbed it out of the dumpster. <laughs> so I've got oh, like, yeah. one of those. Got it, got it. And and when you say the display, you're talking about the big plastic molded This was a big Game like, Boy. purple Game Boy <laughs> Color thing that was supposed to be like, you know, we dominate. And it's just like nobody wanted it, even That's Toys R Us. Awesome. Yeah, they <laughs> they had a they have a DSI at Nintendo of America down uh, at their offices in Redwood, and it's huge. And I just keep thinking, man, it, I hope they never get rid of that. Even though yeah. I wouldn't take it, but it's but it'll like, happen, right? Yeah. Like this happens all the time yeah. when sometimes when studios close or when mm -hmm. you know companies move, you're like, oh, we're not gonna move that stuff, yeah. and boom, something big is gone. Yep, sure. yeah. Yeah. That just happened recently. IDOS was moving offices, and Frank Cifaldi, who works with us, got the call of like, we don't know what we want to do with all this stuff, and uh, Frank and I are heavy into the uh, museum stuff so we're like we need to just grab it all and now our office is like floor to ceiling of idos stuff like <laughs> statues and everything yeah, all, all the statues two meters yeah and, it's like yeah. people visit us and they're like you guys doing a lot of work for idos uh -huh. no not really but. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what do you got man yeah yeah uh, uh, well see. yeah let's go, uh or? yeah let's each take a turn because we each brought something so i guess i'll go first all right he'll go see, first my, my first one is a cheap uh <laughs> but it is one of my favorite. So these are sort of Nintendo treasures. Treasure to us, maybe not worth a lot of money. But uh, I went through a lot of trouble of trying to get this game. Oh, nice. So this is a Japanese version of uh, Castlevania III Dracula's Curse, which in Japan is called Akuma Jo Densetsu. And uh, this came out in Japan in 1989. Um, and one of the reasons I'm so fond of it, on top of loving Castlevania so much, was the fact that uh, the music was absolutely yeah. amazing. They had a customized chip built into it called oh, yeah, the VRC6, right. I believe. Um, and it it just had this edge to sound that I just did not hear from any other NES cartridge, oh, especially yeah. the first time I heard it. Isn't that like, do you already remember the game Lagrange Point that Konami? I don't know that was one like too. An was that another VRC6? I think they had a the same. Okay, cool, cool. That's one that um, they haven't released here stateside or even emulated, which would be awesome to see. Yeah, and, and we've talked about uh, Castlevania and you know how much I kind of adore the series, and especially that game on this podcast. We've even had comparisons of the music. So if you know if you're curious what I'm talking about and you haven't heard those, please go back and check them out. But that's the first thing I brought in. It is. Uh, a piece of Nintendo history to me, it was a pain in the butt to find, especially yeah. in a box with, uh, with you know, with manuals and all the inserts inside. Like, it was, you know, and Japan is hardcore, man. Like, they really As are. a collector, like, I know you must appreciate <laughs> what Japan does when it comes to collecting old school yeah. Uh, oh, stuff. yeah, I mean, even when you go in the shops, it's hard to, like, this is in great shape. You, it's really difficult to find a box in this kind of shape, especially mm -hmm. in the used shops. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Was this used or new when you got uh, it? No, it was used when I yeah. got it. Yeah, no, new, I, I couldn't afford to. No, no, <laughs> new. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. For sure. Cool. So that that's the first thing I'm bringing in. So, Pear, I Very turn nice. it to you. What, so what did you bring? Yeah. You know, since uh, let me see. Since Mike is here, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a mic friendly thing. I have some backups just in case we had the same things. Yeah, I know. Same here. So I didn't bring anything like signed or anything, but like more things from from oh. history. So, Mike, this is your life. Um, so this is a uh, this is a June '98 copy of Next Generation that never was sold in stores. Yep. So it's a oh. This is awesome. Neither too, was the way. insert. Yep. And so <laughs> this edition, the regular edition, had like a Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time yeah. cover because, um, you know, that was the, the big feature. Um, but this was the special Atlanta E3 edition. Yep. Is that right? That is correct. And uh, we had 5,000 of those, I think, made specifically mm -hmm. for the show. And it, it comes from actually a mishap uh, because people misunderstood Howard Lincoln, a quote from Howard Lincoln saying that the game was to be on a gold cartridge <laughs> because it was Matt Cass Messina, I think, who asked him this question at Nintendo um, with other reporters in the room, will the game be on a gold cartridge? And Howard Lincoln mistook the question as, will it go gold? Yeah. And he's like, well, naturally, it's going to be like, it's going to go gold. Well, we were like, yeah, yeah. breaking news, boom, And gold it was cartridge. everywhere, and it forced Nintendo to actually – ship it on a golden cartridge yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and change, change it up. So to perpetuate the myth, because mm -hmm. we heard that that wasn't really what they intended, Next Gen decided they're going to do the gold cartridge mm -hmm. on the cover just to really make and, sure and the gold just to make sure they is, don't uh, forget. It's yeah. in the style of like the original Legend of Zelda and Zelda 2, uh, The Adventure of Link. So it's sort of that gold style versus the one that came out. But it's still, it's very cool to hear that you guys forced this into existence. And it's, it's funny too, because it says Zelda 64. This is like a cobbled together logo that you guys made at Next yep, Generation. We just made it up. With the old mm -hmm. art, you know, the uh, the artwork that they released at the time. A 
to A ESRB rating, yep. which doesn't exist anymore. Not Kids anymore. to uh, adults, yeah. And to support your item here, because I'm just <laughs> going to back you up with this a little bit, we were at Next Gen, we were trying so hard to get the cover story for Zelda. And we went so far as to make the Nintendo a Game Boy, a Game Boy cartridge that we sent to them with a Game Boy that had a proposal on here for us to do the Zelda story. And, and get that. So, so you programmed uh, we programmed what? an actual game. Uh, it's actually not a game. It's like a slideshow with music mm -hmm, and all this sure. stuff. And we sent that to Nintendo. We sent like four of them out to different people at Nintendo to woo them over to let us do did, stuff like did that. Did they respond to it? Did, did you they, hear anything said, back? Thank you. And they did the typical Nintendo thing. Like, thank ah, you. We can't accept this. They even sent the things back. When, like, no. oh, that was a great idea. Uh, one, I think three of the four came back or something like oh that. Oh, my God. And, wow. Uh, and this is an actual Nintendo Game Boy cartridge I'm holding in my hand right that's now. That's probably they're like, oh, he tampered with it. Label. We cannot <laughs> possibly hold this. Yeah, it's, there is like that awkward thing where it's like, oh, they're pressed, so we can't complain about this, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. But they were, they were impressed. And I think that really helped us get the story. We wanted. So, so, so what, what game was lost in the making of this? Do you remember? Like, oh, was, I don't remember. Was another game substituted that was originally it was on this what cartridge? It was ever on our desk at the time? Because Motocross there was like, Maniacs, maybe. Yeah, it's like probably, something. probably, it's probably like every single one of them was probably. <laughs> I like that you brought this because we didn't sync up on this <clears> at, all, up at all. So but that's didn't... amazing that you did that because like here you can see the logo. Yeah, it was all in the same time that yep. we're trying to get all this stuff. And the, the, I mean, I remember back then. Since you know, since this is a long time ago, I think we can talk a little bit yeah. about how the sausage was made too. You guys had a hard time getting any assets from Nintendo yes. in the format that it was printable or at all. Like they would send something that they had already distributed a year ago, exactly. right? Exactly. And they would they would try to tell us, "Okay, that's all we're gonna get." And we have, and we would we had to, as next generation, we pride prided ourselves on getting exclusive screens mm -hmm. and stuff. So it was really challenging. So we even went so far as to get. Um, one of the McFarlane action figure sculptors sculpted a Zelda or um, uh, a Link statue for us that uh, we could use the 3D scan. We got the guys who were doing the Godzilla movie effects to 3D scan it so we can show Nintendo that we could make an incredible cover with 3D assets and all this money spent on this thing and they're just kind of like, mm, yeah, I don't know. Wow. <laughs> it was just very, they didn't operate like that, right? No. And they didn't do screen captures properly either. I mean, no. they were just not ready for the press in a, in a lot of ways. Well, so we had to, str we struggled to try to get better screenshots and everything ourselves yeah. to promote their products. Yeah. 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 But this, I, I looked, you know, before this, I just looked through this mag and it, it, it's just fantastic. I mean, it was just so good. All the stuff that's in here, the interviews, you know, about oh, yeah. Lucas Arts coming into its own the Zelda feature you got a review of 1080 snowboarding giving oh, it a man. five stars and then of course my favorite insert this one was uh, since this was the E3 edition they had yep. like this Imagine Media the Imagine Games Network flyer and Imagine online, Radio yeah. There was Imagine Radio. You want to talk to me about that? What was yeah, that? Yeah, that was that was a side project where it was audio programming um, oh, online like as this well. Podcast. But, but cool. yeah, so the, what you're seeing works. here is actually you see <laughs> The Den, which was yeah. a website about entertainment. So movies, television, comics, sci-fi. And you have Imagine Games Network, which is, of course, IGN. is what IGN became. We merged with The Den. That's what IGN is today. Yeah. And so those two sites actually formed IGN. Yep. So it was really cool like to find that in there. And uh, one special note on Next Generation, because it looks gorgeous and everything, uh, Mike Wilmoth, who just recently passed away, was the yes. uh, design, graphic designer and layout artist on all these magazines. He did a wonderful job, made everything we did look great, especially in the 11th hour, and it's, it's just kind of sad to so yeah, no, it is, and it's it's kind of it's there isn't a gaming mag like this. I mean, Edge and Next Gen obviously share the same yeah. roots, and and mm -hmm. and Edge survives. Um, it's a little easier in the yep. UK to run a, a magazine business with a with a smaller run, and so Edge is still around and does some of that. But yeah. you know, like that high quality print product yeah. with really deep researched Just interviews, cover stock too, and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then I will say, you know, like we did not get the same access the magazines did back then, so yeah. it was really special too when it came. It was out. a different like, time. Yeah. <laughs> different time very very cool okay Excellent. so round so, one is in the books round, round one all right so uh this one is made by nintendo and i got this not so long ago and it's not the version that i want but unfortunately <laughs> that's what i had to take uh so it is a copy of earthbound for the super Ooh, nintendo nice. so i made it a mission after uh, i played earthbound to buy a copy of every Earth, uh, every version I can find in English and Japanese. So obviously for Earthbound for Super Nintendo, that's an easy one, right? It's only one yeah. version. But uh, I went out of my way and bought uh, all the Mother games also in Japanese as well. Yeah. So Mother 3, uh, Mother 1 Plus 2, which was a re-release of 1 and 2 right when, around when 3 came out. Um, the original Famicom cartridge as well. Uh, I had to settle for an Earthbound without a box, without a <laughs> manual. It does have, uh, I do have the strategy guide for it and a funny side <laughs> story. Last year um, at PAX Prime, I met Marcus Limblom, yes. who was the uh, localization editor on that game. Um, and I 
you know, we had talked before that. Like, he was actually on a podcast that I had at One Up, you know, a year before that. And, uh, you know, we had coffee, and I was like, hey, man, can you sign my strategy guide? And, mm-hmm. and he did, um, and, it, and it was really cool. And he's, uh, he's, he's an awesome dude. And if you don't know EarthBound, uh, a year, actually a year ago to this episode, uh, we recorded a very special EarthBound episode mm-hmm. um, of Nintendo Voice Chat where we talked about what was so special about that game and why it was so cool and how it's a really touching story about, like, four kids, you know, who stumble on an adventure. And you it's kind of dope. And the franchise lives on, obviously, like, now in Smash Brothers, right? Mm-hmm. Actually, yeah, I have an, if you're done, I have an item that kind of ties in. Oh, Oh, that's that, it. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Ah, I'm so <laughs> jealous of the item because so, I knew he was oh, bringing it. So the little-known thing about Nintendo is that, uh, at least in the West, is that they have tremendous sense of style when it comes to special editions in Japan. They do. So, yeah. you know, whether it's releasing special mini cartridges from the Super Famicom disc days or, yeah. you know, their packaging is really awesome. It mm-hmm. is like, you know, yeah. what you'd expect from an Apple over exactly. here, right? And so this is actually the Mother 3... This is Mother 2, right? Yeah. Earthbound yeah, is Mother yeah, 2. Yeah, yeah. The Mother 3 versus... special edition of the Game Boy Micro. And, uh, you know, because this package inside is really tricky. Um, I, I took the, uh, the, the Game Boy out already. So here's yeah. the Game Boy Micro, and it comes in this special Game Boy Micro pack. And it's, it also comes with a Franklin oh, badge. My it's so it has a Franklin amazing. badge. So it looks really awesome. They did this distressed design, you know, yeah. in the faceplate with uh, the buttons like that. And, you know, this was a great system. Uh, it was just priced way too high. Yep. It came at the wrong time, and therefore it never took off. But uh, this was great. Never came to the West, of course. Yeah, neither uh, did Mother 3, just because it was so late in the Game Boy Advance's life cycle. Yeah, At least that's the reason all of us have hung on to. And the reason why this, this is so special to me, personally, is that I saw Mother 3 when it was a 6040D game. That's right. You were there. And so, you oh, know, man. they actually showed this at, at Space World, um, where you got to see scenes from Mother 3 in a demo, and Shigesato Itoi, who was the lead on the game, yeah. was working on was it. Was he there? And, uh, yeah, he was there, and you, you were like, you were getting really excited to see Earthbound, you know, taking steps into the third, like the 3D realm. It was polygonal and everything. Of course, it never came out. It ran into development hell, and, you know, there's some strained relations with Itoi with Nintendo, too. There was another game that he worked on that didn't work out that well. And so, in the end, you know, they brought in Brownie Brown and some mm-hmm. other folks, and Itoi obviously was the scriptwriter, and created this 2D version of, of Earthbound 2, of Mother 3. Um, which is a really good game, but it's yeah. funny. Like when you see the graphics side by side, like you see like the saloon uh, scene from the 6040D, and then the the 2D version. It's mm-hmm. like it is that game. <laughs> it is know? the same game, and yeah. it's just you kind of see what it could have been. I will say this one will live on, and the the 3D one probably wouldn't have been as good. Mm-hmm. You know, That's like it's just true. yeah, they're so it's so timeless in yeah. this form. And that was at that awkward time when people who were developing these incredible 2D experiences, like Mother Two and all yeah. stuff were getting their feet wet, so they were experimenting as they were going into 3D, and like more often than not, that like it didn't prove out very well in those yeah. days. And so yeah. there's a good chance that there's a reason that had to kind yeah. of go its own way, and, and this ha- this happened, and it's probably better for it. Yeah, yeah no, people for sure. today, like I, I run into people today who've never played the games, they've downloaded it on Virtual Console, the Earthbound game, mm-hmm. and fallen in love with the game. Like as dated as the controls and everything kind of are, yeah, it, it's still timeless. Yeah, and yeah, it, 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 it holds up. And the story is yeah. really great. The writing's really strong, and uh, yeah, and you can download. Earthbound today. That was such a special thing for me last Comic Con because I had to play Earthbound when you couldn't do that, and yeah. that was I just kind of put my head down because I was like, do I really have to do it this way? <laughs> and it was really unfortunate. Um, but now that it's out on Virtual Console, it was yeah. a really cool thing. Look how cool this is! So like they amazing. have just mon- monochrome packaging like that, and yeah, this describe package it well is like, for radio. yeah. So if you're if you're obviously if you're listening, you can always Google it. The you know Mother Three Game Boy Micro. I actually wrote a blog post about it like ten years ago, or whatever. But like you see, the packaging is like gray kind of cardboard with red inside and it's like they really took care to make this something that is a collectible yeah. and really special you know so mm-hmm. yeah i love this thing so cool. on that note I, I didn't this is i actually wasn't going to show this one but because the packaging thing is such a good theme here i yeah. wanted to show what they used to do for the famicom minis but oh, that's it yeah that's so, it because like this is the same thing like they could they, they celebrated the original packaging so making a smaller version of it it's signed by miyamoto which is awesome very nice um, but also they would put it in this kind of like showcase box to show off the, the game like like this this is just like you open this up and everything about it is just screaming like criterion masterwork yeah that's the thing yeah oh, and yeah. the same here they did the same with these they had a whole series of these which were fantastic and I, these, these aren't necessarily rare but the u.s versions just weren't as 
cool. Like the packaging just wasn't as cool. As yeah, this. they didn't they didn't quite go as retro as it. Whereas these were specifically and and in this case it was the Famicom Disk System games yeah. that they really went the extra mile to show yeah, it sort of in the, that light to show the difference. Yeah, the original like, here's the disc yeah. version of it right there. And um, like again, these are like we're talking about rarities and stuff. These aren't very rare. You can find these pretty cheap mm-hmm. right now yeah. in pretty condition. Um, but that packaging, it's it's just something, if you're going to show off anything in your house or whatever, it's like the packaging on this stuff is fantastic. So even the yep. detail, so that cartridge is also the same color as the disc. It is yellow. Yes. And I thought that was also a really nice touch because once you open it up, you're like, oh, okay, it's, well, it's Zelda 1. And you're like, oh, wait, it's yellow, just like the disc would have been. Oh, my exactly. God, that's so cool. It's like they, it's, they're full, fully aware of their history and everything that made it such a special yeah. kind of thing. And it's like, it, you know, Japan, I think, did have a special relationship with the early days of gaming, you know, come on, because this was Japan bringing back video games too right like it it was so special but i think that exists in the west too like everybody remembered that gold cartridge right and so that is i'm glad they did that with ocarina of time but they didn't need us to tell them to do that like that should be ingrained at a company like that that exactly you celebrate those special moments in time and even more like eventually they took away the the gold off the cartridge for ocarina of time you're like Mm -hmm. why did you just keep doing it yeah Yeah. Yeah. well it's weird too because in japan zelda is not really all about the gold it's actually green over there yeah they don't do gold cartridges it's not really as 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 uh important we like our bling over here Mm -hmm. yeah pretty much all right so my last item is a, is also a signed item, uh, and it is not a rare item really, but it is rare wow. in that it's signed. Yep. Uh, so this is marvelous, oh, um, wow. another mm-hmm. Treasure Island. Which, uh, if you don't know, this was our mm-hmm. AG, a little guy named A.G. Numa. This was his first directed game at Nintendo. Um, who is that? You may ask. He is currently the producer on the Zelda series. So uh, when he was, uh, let's see, this game originally came out in 1996 in Japan only. Uh, the story revolves around three kids uh, on a camping, I think some kind of like camping adventure, and then they, you know, end up on a quest for like great treasure or something. Some pirates show up, so, uh, some kind of deal. But uh, so last year at New York Comic Con, I had a chance to interview Anuma, and I got really weird about asking anyone to sign things. I actually haven't asked someone to sign something since this, uh, just because it, it always feels weird when you're pressed because I feel like, oh, am yeah. I overstepping, you know, my access? Like, it, Joe Average can't do this. Why should I take advantage of this? So that was my reasoning. So, but I still decided, okay, if I'm going to get something signed, this is the the second and the last time. Notice I said second. It means something was signed before that. Um, and I asked him, and he was like, oh, my God, where did you get that? Like, he was so surprised on him himself. He just looked at, he goes, you know, I didn't come out here. And I was like, no, I know, but it's it's really cool, and I would love if you signed it. But the f- weird part was, if you look at it, the signature is in a gold pen that you can barely see. Oh, it's, yeah, I was like, wondering, where is it? Yeah, I'm like, okay, maybe it's on another oh, one. Oh, like, there it is. Yeah, yeah. down here in the corner, which you will not be able to see. It was a gold Sharpie on me. I didn't have a black <laughs> Sharpie. And I was like classic mistake you oh, went funny. out of your way and asked Anuma to sign something and then you brought a pen that no one can see it in so but you have in to hold way, it in the right yeah, light it's like a lenticular it's like you angle it and you're like oh there's the name that mm-hmm. makes it so special though yeah, yeah it does so he'll yeah. probably never forget me or that gold pen and, or how hard I'm it was sure to sign it I'm thinking about you right now maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's pretty yeah, awesome so, that, so that's my last uh, piece and also that game as I said earlier has not come out in the west uh, it's a really good game it's very sort very of cool. point and click adventure yeah. style um, it, it has been like fan translated, so you can find some material on it on the That's internet. Cool. I need some more room. All right. Oh, oh yeah. I, I have oh, what you're going to do. I know what you're pulling. <sighs> yes. Okay. He's got his name on so it, too. That one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, well, it's uh, for it. those at home who are listening, Pear just put an N64 with a very special attachment attached underneath it called the 64DD. That's right. Pear yeah. is one of the few owners that I know who has a 64D. Oh, Mike, I'm, have you ever gotten I'm one? Sure. You know, actually, I have, I have not. Uh, okay. It's one of those things where I, I've kind of wanted one, but every time I've run into it, it's been way too expensive. Smash and grab, dude. Oh, I'll man, take the I Mother know. 3. You take you the... You know what? Have my back. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll do this. I've got bricks in the car from the Atari building, so... <laughs> so there... <laughs> you know, there, there, are, there are definitely... They can run as high as a grand now, yeah. right? Without yeah. the N64 yep. on top. You need a Japanese N64. You need to mod it so it can yeah. actually fit. And this was the mysterious slot on the bottom of the N64, yeah. right? Like it, tantalizing was there. The memory card was tantalizingly there the entire time. And that was actually designed for the future 64DD usage. It needed the extra RAM. And of course, Turok forced yeah. Nintendo's hands to actually put it out without it. Um, but yeah, so it can it, it, you can find one for a little cheaper. There are two versions out. Uh, the Most of them... Um, there was a retail version that was released into a limited run because they couldn't sell them, right? Like, it was a total dud in Japan. You had to actually pre-order it. It was a, it was a, a mail-order campaign 
we had to pay by credit card in Japan. And so they sold 15,000 only. Oh, that was the whole run. That was it. Yeah. So there are a couple more out there because they had then that retail box afterwards, which I didn't get. This was the RantNet edition. And so when you bought it, you also had to commit to buy the software, yep. which arrived every couple of months. So this came out in 1999. You got it with like uh, Mario Artist. So uh, you kickstarted Polygon 64DD. That's, yeah. that's what basically what it was. So it was like a <laughs> subscription for this thing. And their commitment was we'll have this RantNet, Rant with an R, um, service um, that – it's basically kind of like a like a internet light. You can read like horse racing magazines <laughs> on your N64 and that kind of stuff. You could also uh, share stuff and connect uh, in some of the games. Uh, but then you also got this. So Talent uh, Studio, this one, uh, Mario Artist Talent Studio, was one of three games oh in the Mario God. Artist series that Hang came on, out. Please describe the artwork that's on the back of this the, box for people. <laughs> the please. artwork, you can't see that, but it's uh, Mario with a 70s fro. <laughs> um, singing with a mic, and so the whole point of this, and uh, we insane. we talked a little bit about this on NVC before. It's like this was basically what Tomodachi Collection would yeah. become, right? And, and so to an extent too. Yeah. So if you can't see what I'm holding, this is actually the capture cartridge, and this is one of many uh, uh, different cartridges that came with the 6040D subscription. The other one was the modem, mm -hmm. and so the modem basically you plugged in as a cartridge on the top. And the capture cartridge was a separate one. It had the old kind of RCA yeah. inputs. You could plug in a camera or you could plug in a VCR, and then you could capture stills, and you could use those stills at textures for, for things that you would use in this thing. I remember seeing an early version of Perfect Dark where you could capture stills and then map them to characters in Perfect Dark. That's right. Yeah, yeah and like then faces. they got spooked. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and actually m my face was captured that way and actually made it into the final game. So I'm one of the bad guys in it. Oh, that's awesome. They left that Just in. like real life. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, kidding, they were I'm Russians, though, so not Germans. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, yeah, they, they got spooked, right? Because yeah. then the press start, said, oh, you will be able to shoot your friend. It's like, oh, yeah, they got really worried also, about what that. what will end up on that. And yeah. Because like, there's mm -hmm. the old story, like the, the early arcade game that would eventually become Journey, the arcade game, where yeah. they put a camera in an arcade, and they were, you could put your face and characters in the game and also on the high score. And, of course, there was never a face, but there was always something else mm -hmm. that would show up in public. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just always had a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I was just uh, – I was just playing. Uh, my my son uh, got an Xbox One with his own money, and he uh, downloaded immediately Project Spark because it's free. Oh yeah. The first video stream that came up was a jumping penis. Oh, yeah, man. it's like it happens, right? Like, no, it's funny. Like that means nobody's looking at oh, it yeah. right yeah. now on the Xbox One. <laughs> but um, but it's that's what people did. That's what we did with yeah. Talent Studio Two. Immediately, you create created butt face characters. Exactly. With this thing, you could do like these. Uh, you can make your own movies and like move uh, have like uh, polygonal characters. Give them different like um, items uh, used like pre-made uh, selections you could import images with the Game Boy camera too yep. yeah, yeah so that's on the side of this thing it shipped with that crazy yellow microphone that oh, was yeah. also in Hey You Pikachu yep. remember that one yep. Um, and so it, it was just a really cool thing, and, and actually for a family to play with, it was really fun. It was ridiculous to make these movies of you know your your brother or your dad like jumping oh, around yeah. doing a fashion show. Um, yeah. But it was so daunting. Like just look at the setup. You have to build this giant Big Mac of a video game system in order to get going. Hey, Sega did it a couple times. I don't know if yeah. you've heard the Genesis Tower of Power is real. And it, the it toilet add-on for the yeah. uh, Jaguar, Jaguar and everything. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. the flush button. So yeah. the, the logo to Rand that I'd never seen it before. So eyeballs, it's just two yeah. eyeballs and like a nose, and it's almost like Mario's eyes, I guess, because they're it kind of very blue. similar to Miyamoto's signature, which he does right yeah. there. Yeah, actually, no, that's true. <laughs> but yeah, it's so funny, right? Eyeballs. Like, so they were playing around with this kind of internet connectivity very early on. If you think yeah. about that, we're talking about you know a generation where no other games were really going online, right? That's like right. you had some some simple stuff, but they had aspirations to create a network where gamers could share information and maybe yep. play against each other. It's really but, easy to pick on Nintendo because of yeah. where they are right now, but like. Like they did all this stuff. First. The mistake they made was they created a closed system, right? Yeah. Like the internet yeah. then ran. Well, and they made it Japan only too, and they had tried the experiments with that stuff even as early as Super Nintendo, right? With uh, the Super Famicom yeah. had a uh, Satellaview yep. and, and ideas like that. That used a satellite system yeah. for broadcasting, yeah. right? And you get goes all the way back to even the oldest of game systems. They would always have like either through cable or over the air and all that sort of yeah. thing. But yeah, what that activity was always yeah. a big deal for them. I think what yeah. points, what, uh, the, yeah, there was the exactly like they wanted to link up every device with every device in their lineup too right like yeah. they had these um these uh, demos that they showed where you connected the game boy and yeah. everything yeah, but, i was gonna say that yeah the like, gamecube to game boy stuff i'm just still yeah, like well, okay dt yeah, yeah. and all those things but the interesting thing about this is i think it just shows you nintendo r&d yep and 
the stuff that never came out, you know, like you can imagine how many different experiments led to this, oh, right? Yeah. This was them basically saying, oh, yeah, we know we need more storage space, both for reading and writing, but we're not going to do CDs because <laughs> we don't want to pay anybody for their format. Therefore, we create this giant freaking disk system, yep. right, yeah. with cartridges and all that. And it's like... There, there must be just hundreds of ideas that never came out. It would know? be amazing if they had like a vault that you could just like yeah. someday walk through and just see all the stuff. Because like Miyamoto's always alluded to, like I've got this thing on my desk, and oh, it's always like, right, yeah. hundreds of Luigi's running around and doing whatever mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. So it's like you yeah. want to know what those turned into, yeah, or what Mario 128 turned into, yeah. or what like different things that they've shown the press over time turned into. He's gotten yeah. more careful, but back then when we asked inter interview questions, it'd be like Mario 64 had come out, and we're like. Uh, have you ever thought about doing a co-op game or two-player like you did with Mario and Luigi? He's like, ah, I have Mario and Luigi already yeah. running in 3D yeah. on my desk. He <laughs> used to always say, on my desk, He used to say all right? that stuff on my desk. And we're like, okay, can you get it off your desk? <laughs> Where is your desk? Uh -huh. I'll be there we tomorrow. would like your desk, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Uh, one would hope that one day Nintendo does kind of open open its doors a little yeah. more and just show people like cause the, the opportunity for a museum just to see what those experiments were and where they ended up like imagine what's in there yeah. it's like Star Fox 2 the Super FX chip game that yeah. I remember seeing at the show and then going to Nintendo US and seeing the mocked up boxes in their faux store mm -hmm. and thinking like oh I can't wait for that I can't wait for that and it just never came out and it was pretty much done yeah. and I was saying like they probably had so many games that went all the way up to the point of completion and just didn't ship it yeah. Yeah. and yeah. what are those games and so many we haven't heard of I'm sure yeah for look sure. at a, a, another great example that was Earthbound Zero where yeah. they you know Earthbound Zero was the uh, NES version the Famicom version of Mother was translated uh, but never released yep. and it just sat in NOA for years until somehow made its way out then it ended up on an auction I think then someone bought it and was like wait a minute this is legit translation <laughs> this was not <laughs> this was not fan translated. Yeah. This was actually Nintendo translated this. Yeah. Was like, what? <laughs> Yeah, so when we got this thing, by the way, the first thing we did was plug in every cartridge we had, you know, the Japanese ones, to see what would happen. Yeah. And, like, you know, it would usually just boot the game, boot the game, boot the game yeah. with the 64DD plugged in. Then you put in Ocarina of Time, the Japanese edition, and it goes, insert expansion disc. Oh, that's you awesome. You know, and you're like, oh, my God, that's so cool. <laughs> right? F-Zero like, right? So, yeah, F-Zero yeah. did, too. And, yeah, mm -hmm. so that was Uda Zelda, they called it, which is, yeah. of course, the Master Quest, yeah, right? That was, that was supposed mask, yeah. to come on a disc. And okay. that that never made it out. Okay, so like you have that. all the uh, the 64DD games then? So I have all the 64DD games. You know, some were canceled later. Like Mario Artist was supposed to have Soundmaker and some other um, installments. They didn't guarantee that, but there's uh, SimCity for the 64DD, which is not very good. But you can then import pictures you took with a capture cartridge into that game, put it on a billboard in the game. Like it it all connected somehow, yeah. right? Nice. So, but F0 64DD, the, the expansion kit, was brilliant. It's great. Okay. We got to play it sometime. All right. So how can you top that? Uh, well, oh, you like, can. I know so you can. Things, but um, I, got, I did get this. This came from uh, Frank Cifaldi, and I grab uh, one of the best versions of it here. Okay. And uh, Friend of the show, Frank? Friend of the show, Frank. And uh, he's like the preeminent Nintendo authority these days. Like, mm -hmm. he's been he's, – he's the guy who wanted to find out the actual ship date of Super Mario Brothers That's and right. found out there is no uh, definitive date that it was shipped, and it's impossible to figure it out. So – He's been on the hunt for that, but along the way, he found the very first Nintendo uh, advertisement, which um, nice. I will show you, actually, so you can see it, and then we'll show everybody else. Yeah. But um, it, it shows, uh, pre uh, predominantly, it shows Rob, the robot, because they were really trying to sell people on this is not just a game system in order to get, like, buyers, of course, to... Yeah. Uh, to look into it, but that this word is the, entertainment. That was Gail yeah. Tilden, who uh, yeah. we had worked with in the day. Yeah, she yeah. Uh, worked on a lot of the copy for this with uh, some, uh, with an ad agency, and this is the very first Nintendo ad to go out there. And uh, Frank happened to find out find it, and this is a reproduction of it, of course, okay. um, because he's uh, he's making sure that thing doesn't get even oxygen on it. Um, yeah. But he had, he had, I think this is great, he actually reproduced this for Gail because she didn't have this. Oh, wow. And so he's down at Comic-Con right now presenting her with this, so she has the very first oh, ad that's she so worked cool. on. So you and know what magazine it came from at all? Does anyone No, and you know, I don't say? know if Frank actually even knows. Somebody yeah. had managed to find this cut out of the magazine, so okay. he's he's in process of figuring that out, I think. Got it. Wow. Um, okay. I'm sure, I mean, he might know more than I do on that, but like it seems like this was as close as we've got so far to mm -hmm. having this, which is great. I mean, you, it's like Rob coming out of a piece of paper or whatever, I don't know why, but... Um, it's kind of nice to see that. And this was, like, for the New York launch of the NES. Wow. So, so. That's so cool. That's full yeah. circle for me, man. I was there. 
You were there. Was were born, you? born and raised so in New you, York. Did you so. go to FAO Schwartz where there were? So I suspect my mom did. I don't know the. F- I never bothered to ask the full details of how we got an NES, but I know yeah. that you know <laughs> I was I was a second grader. I want to say, and that Christmas it was just under the tree, and it was this huge box, and Rob was prominently displayed on it, and it's it's that box you see everywhere, and it was just like holy cow, this is. I'm pretty sure it was from that first run, and I've never bothered to ask her, how did you pull that off? It's amazing because uh-huh. so many people, are, like, that moment was important, obviously, for mm-hmm. many reasons, but uh, so many influential people walked through those doors at the right time to see that stuff. Like Tom Zito, who would eventually do digital pictures, mm-hmm. um, he was in New York at the time, happened to go to the store and see the NES and realized, this is insane, this is going to change everything. Yeah. And he came back to California with one <laughs> to preach the gospel of video games again. Yeah. And he took that thing around everywhere and said, like, we have to get back in the game. This is what we have to do and everything. It would lead up to, of course, like, digital pictures and other stuff that he did. But, like, um, so many people walked through there and took this everywhere else that it was, like, people at Atari and everywhere else were like, wait, I thought this is all done. What, what do you mean this yeah. is over again? And uh, the impact that had and the repercussions it had across the country and around sure. the world was just amazing. I just, so, I just love that it was a media format for at one point where people said, all right, that's over. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. all right, so we all played games. Now we're going back to watching yeah. television. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, or the yeah. arcades were going to be the way you were going to play games and it's, forget the home console. It's, yeah. like, it's yeah. like the way people talk about Guitar Hero now. You know, yeah. it's like, well, who, well, who's to say that it won't be back in some form? You know? It's true. Yeah. And like, <laughs> if you have the room for all those instruments. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but like, who was, who think that like a robot would be a great thing to bring video games back or anything like that. But, yeah. um, I have a bunch of random stuff I'll just pull out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because I have it here. Um, this one I thought was cool because like Everybody loves Famicom. We're telling Whoa. these kind of sad stories. Was the Famicom tissue dispenser <laughs> <laughs> with That's the amazing. disc system? So this could actually, I think, be compatible with your snot. Um, Where did you get that? You know, this was like in 2004. I think they made these a very limited run of these. Okay. They also did like a pen case. That's a Famicom controller and like this pen. It's like bizarre, like. You think, like, if they're going to do a tissue holder, would it be something, like, in fiction with their stories? Or I was like, no, let's just do this. Uh-huh. Like, let's make it. <laughs> this, this eventually came out as the worm cam for GBA. Oh, yeah. Remember this thing where it's yeah. supposed to be able to take photos and all this stuff? But if you notice, it has, like, this phone jack. The early version of it was actually pretty amazing. It was a really amazing piece of hardware. And I think, ultimately, cost was what killed a lot of the features. But the phone jack allowed you to have video conferencing on the GBA with your friends. So you'd be able to actually talk to one another and see each other, like, Skype. Over the GBA. What? It was really cool and wow, crazy. Man. And also, um, there were some demos that um, that were included with this that demonstrate how you could be playing a game that would it could load into this, and you'd be playing this game, and it'd be like Mario. There's like this Mario Kart demo, and you could see the other person's face in the corner. It was really low res and crappy, and it's coming through a phone jack. But you were playing them over a phone jack, like almost like playing online, and you could see each other and have like kind of uh, primitive voice chat. They eventually like dumbed it all down and it became worm cam or whatever but yeah this was this is a pretty cool cool thing i remember them that's coming awesome. to our office and showing it and we're like this is awesome wow <laughs> that's really cool man that reminds me of uh so we have in house uh do you know todd todd northcutt i i know Kids of fight, yeah. oh okay yes. yeah yeah because todd worked on uh, uh what was it called again wi-fi connect and mm-hmm. he had mentioned how in like early talks they had ideas where like what if you could have conversations with your friends over the microphone, over the internet? And Tom oh, yeah. was just like, I don't know if this is going to work. Like, what are you talking about? Like, so, so that's a perfect systems. segue to the next thing because even though this doesn't look like much, this is Gauntlet for DS. Uh, Whoa. Uh, one of the last games I worked on for, D- for DS with a talented group of people, and we we're doing this as a first party Nintendo game. Nintendo okay. had gone out and acquired the rights to Gauntlet from Midway. And this is at the time when PSP had just launched, okay. and they were worried about the U.S. and other markets not having enough action games like the PSP had. And I think there, there's this like Untold Legends or something that was on PSP, this game that was very Gauntlet-like. Yeah. And so Nintendo had seen that, and they had talked to Midway then to get the actual like Gauntlet rights because they thought um, because the producer at Nintendo and his partner uh, on the project were old college roommates and they used to play Gauntlet all the time. So uh-huh. they called us out of the blue, and it was one of these things where. Yeah, like, this would be awesome. Like, Gauntlet, let's talk about it. And they're like, we're going to be out Saturday. And it's like, okay. So we scrambled and got every Gauntlet game we get our hands on, the arcade game, the old NES game, and old home computer games, filled our room up with it. And when they arrived, we played the whole day we played Gauntlet together. And we didn't know really where it was going. And when they left, we're like, did they just want to come over and play Gauntlet? How that's going on? <laughs> and then we had the deal with Nintendo. It was just like, out of the blue, it's like, okay, we're going to proceed. And it's like, oh, this is awesome. But we had to proceed with some uh, like strict criteria. We had to do things on the DS that would be comparable or better than what PSP could do. And one of the things that they really wanted was voice over IP 
Um, so, because they had the headset for PSP, and so we developed uh, some crazy technology to allow up to four players to play online with true voice over oh, IP man. while you're playing. And so you could be yelling at each other, telling each other what to do. It had, and it's a really good version of Gauntlet too, um, Gauntlet as well. And uh, it also did 3D on both screens because at the time they had not done that. They'd only done it in non-interactive uh, bits because in I think Mario Kart and stuff like that, like you could see 3D in the intros and stuff, mm-hmm. but then it put a map on the bottom or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're really wanting to get 3D on both screens. So we, we managed to figure that out, which was crazy to do. And then we just filled it with just tons and tons of levels and had all these multiplayer modes. You had Capture the Flag, Death Matches, and all this stuff. And it had this Nintendo stamp of approval on it. It was a very Nintendo game. We are working with Nintendo Japan on it directly. And then at one point, they realized the DS is just killing PSP. They don't need to finish these games. Us and 12, I think 12 other developers are we're one of 12 U.S. developers that they kind of lit this up with. They just killed all the games all at once. Oh, no. It was awful. And uh, But at the same time, Nintendo was amazing because they're like, not only are we killing them, we're going to give you the, these next few milestones. They paid. They were really kind to us on, on the financial okay, side. Okay. And not only that, they walked us into so many publishers to help us sell the game. So we actually got, I think it was IDOS who picked it up next. Mm-hmm. And so we continued working on it there. And then IDOS started to have financial trouble. Oh, so no. there. But it, it almost went out through IDOS. So IDOS actually sent review copies to magazines. And the, the reviews we got were amazing. We had 80% from Retro Gamer at the time who gave it the cover. And then we had like 80 something, 85 or 87% or something like that in another magazine. And everybody was raving about the game and it just never came out. So we've mm. managed to find some copies of it. And just recently somebody had leaked one online. So I'm like, oh, I wonder if I still have that cart. So I went digging for this. Uh-huh. And um, it's it's a great game. I, I wish people could play it. And I, you, know, you can probably play it, play it nefariously by other means. But um, it had a lot of features. In fact, the other thing Nintendo wants to do with this uh, was something called Rival Mode, which is Street Pass. Mm-hmm. So we created one of the earliest versions of Street Pass with this. When you have it shut and you're walking by, and it would collect people that you could decide if they are Gauntlet people you want to play against, and th- that were going by, and you'd like see another Gauntlet player who's that's like so keeping cool. their system shut. Wow. Yeah, see, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, the the roads, the road to where we are now is just paved with so many discontinued projects, yes, right? And exactly. Like, some of them you'll hear about, some of them you'll never hear about, and like, yeah, you know, it's good to hear from you about. But some of the background on this, which is crazy, right? Like yeah. it, here we're yeah. talking about an, a classic arcade game. That company runs into trouble. Somebody else picks up the rights. Somebody else picks up the rights. Yeah. I mean, it's just nuts. And yeah. that's a lot of reason why a lot of games you like you liked when you were a kid and stuff aren't coming out again today because the rights were so chaotic. Yeah. Uh, and who owns what and everything is just it's just a mess. And I work on a lot of collections. A lot of like Capcom, Midway, yeah, right. and all these collections. Yeah. And the hardest thing is to find out who owns the right to the music or who owns the right there. Because you think about it, back in those days, they didn't have a lot of money when they were making these games. Yeah. And they would do deals where it's like, well, if you do the music for us, you get the like soundtrack rights, or you do this and this. And they give away the rights in order to make it cheaper. And then in the long run, some of these games become huge hits and classics, and you're like, you can't reproduce them because one party refuses to participate. Or you take their or, stuff out, and it's not as good or, or sometimes you don't find the party. I mean, oh, we've yeah. had that, too, where we're talking to people from Hudson and saying, yeah. like, hey, can you bring that game back? They're like, oh, do we own that? Do we own that? <laughs> like, they, they weren't sure. Like, yeah. with Evo, for example, everybody loves the old Evo, yep. you know, Super NES game. It's like, well, who owns that now? <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. just asking about it will... I've been in situations where I've been contacted by a publisher who wants us to pursue making a remake of a classic game so we start doing that and at the very beginning of production we find out that oh they don't actually own the rights and mm-hmm. they thought they own the rights it's, it's mm-hmm. like tetris all over again mm-hmm. and then you find out also that 10 other people thought they had the rights and they're making the exact same yeah. game at the moment and then everybody can't do it still happens wow. duke yeah. nukem duke nukem you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> still happens all the time <laughs> but but there is a paper trail to sort of find where the who owns what part of the rights or whatnot like it's not just a, a lot of not things a lot. not and always you know what, the other thing is the industry now is maturing enough that we're losing people who work on these games. There's a lot of people who've been passing away recently mm-hmm. that were here at the dawn of video games and also worked on some NES games and mm-hmm. other stuff who are going up, getting up there in age and they're they're starting to, to die off. And with them goes the paper trail. And mm-hmm. a lot of times it's just a mental trail of who owns what and where these things are. Somewhere out there in some of these kind of storage facilities are things uh, that are getting auctioned off that own, have materials in there about ownership. And like what Frank and what I like to do and a lot of other people out there uh, are trying to do is find these things before they're destroyed or lost. And yeah. So because some of these things are just not gonna. And you do this outside of your regular job as well. I do. I yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> and it invades your your job as well, according to you know all the Tomb Raider IDOS statues. Right is this now. like a Batman Robin thing where you're gonna pass it on to your daughter eventually, or <laughs> probably? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it feels like it's like a calling for a lot of people, and like we're out there just trying to do this. We found 
a game that I can't talk about yet, but we're getting ready to announce that um, was thought I've never even known to exist that was being developed at Atari that is a sequel to one of their biggest selling games, and uh, it was completed, and it's amazing. And for its time in '84, I think is when it was being developed, it was mind blowing the techno- technological advancement it, w- it had done. It, ex- it exceeded um, what was expected at the time in 3D. And um, it, it looks like a Star Fox quality game for an Atari 800. And Holy cow. It's amazing. They decided not to ship it because of financial issues or whatever. And you're like, oh, these man. kind of things are lost, potentially lost. Yeah. Yeah. And what other masterworks are out there yeah. by people who are incredible? You mentioned uh, being at the Atari dig site. Did you get to take anything home, like a specific cartridge? No, you know, they were, this was like one of the most strict uh, digs <laughs> probably ever because they knew that they what they're pulling out of the ground would be limited because they weren't going to pull everything out. And also, it was all property. In order to do it, it would have to become property of Alamogordo, the city. Um, but uh, they were kind enough, after they had pulled it out and cataloged everything, they were kind enough to give me a couple games. So I have a Yars Revenge and an E.T. from the from the dig. They're serialized and numbered from the city of Alamogordo, which is awesome. And that whole, like, the stuff they pulled out of there was just mind-boggling. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Holy cow. Wow. This was a lot of fun. There was I a lot of this. history in, yeah. uh, in in very little time. Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, about there's it. so much more stuff we uh, we could be bringing out and talking about. Well, I we know. should probably yeah. do more of these. Yeah, we yeah. should do more. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you one more. Yeah, yeah, one more. <laughs> do you really? Uh, oh, you know what? You jerk! Tell people at home what that is right now. Well, that'd be a copy of Super Mario 64. Not sign- just a copy of 64. Signed by uh, Miyamoto himself. From, in the bottom uh, right corner. November 12th, 1998, it says. So I actually, what you were saying, I is exactly true. I never ask anybody to sign anything. Yeah. And I think this is, I think I have two signed items from my entire career of, mm. you know, almost you two go. decades. And that was just one where it's like, this was the launch party for yeah. Ocarina of Time, I think, right? Yep. And, uh, you know, just like, I was so in awe of this guy. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to bring this game with me and have him sign it. And him sign, uh, at the same time, a couple of copies of our magazine, too. Yeah. Um, which, you know, we gave out to fans afterwards. Mm-hmm. So around the same time, I had him sign yeah. one of these to the next gen. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that was I agree. Something. Like, I actually, I feel uncomfortable asking them to sign stuff, especially yeah. when I'm like... You're interviewing, uh, you're right? Interviewing yeah. stuff. It's just like yeah. it's just really awkward and stuff. But I have a lot of regrets about that now because there's people who I wish I would have had a signature from. I remember the first time I tried to get Miyamoto's signature. He was on the. I was with Chris Charlie and he was on the way to the bathroom, and we're like, Mr. Miyamoto, and everything. And he came by and he was like dancing around because he had to go to the bathroom really bad, but he was super nice. And we're sitting there like just glowing about his work and blah 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 and talking about stuff. And then like it dawned on, I think it was Chris, who was just like, "Well, you better go to the bathroom." <laughs> and he was just like, you know, he nodded and just ran off as fast as he could. I'm like, oh, I'm sitting there and I had my pen in hand. I'm like, oh, I'll just wait. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I asked. Uh, the, I, I always get interesting reactions, but I, I've only done it twice. And the first guy I tried it with was. Um, Shinji Mikami, oh, and it yeah. was uh, so funny though. I picked a really interesting game because he says no one ever asked him to sign this, but uh, you know everyone runs up to him and is like, "Oh, sign the first Resident Evil, or mm-hmm. sign Resident Evil Four, or sign Vanquish, or something." I brought out a Resident Evil remake, oh, nice. which uh, <laughs> I have personally adored. Like it's I love amazing. that game, and it's uh-huh. an amazing example of a remake and of. Uh, and it was before it even was in vogue, really. Like mm-hmm. this, pre- this previous console generation, you saw a bunch of games get remade, HD collections, all that oh, stuff. Yeah. But remake was like a top to bottom. Like let's just redo this entire game, add new mechanics, add new things. And at the time, I don't think it was it was just very prominent like to do something like that. Can I that. guess which game you had him sign? Uh, what for for remake? No, I had him um, sign remake. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Remake. Okay. I, oh, I thought remake. you were gonna say like you had that there where like I tried to get him to sign. I brought it with me and I didn't manage to get it completely because I, I didn't encounter him in time mm-hmm. um, was Goof Troop oh uh, wow which I thought was an incredible game on Super Nintendo yeah yeah and another connection to that is we were at one point going to port Resident Evil to the Macintosh and we had managed to get source code and we are looking through it and sure enough there was Goof Troop source in Resident Evil <laughs> 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 it was like we were like getting things translated and we're looking at what is this stuff and it's like wait this is this is carryover from Goof Troop like they yeah. actually wow. in Resident Evil the very it, first PlayStation game there's some Goof Troop in there so that's wow. like when people say like humans share 40% DNA with bananas or something <laughs> yeah, exactly. like that's the exact same thing <laughs> you ran the test it yeah. blows my mind like it, it, yeah. I've been fortunate enough to see a lot of source code and I always like get a kick out of like wow that's like looking at the DNA in the source code of like <laughs> mm-hmm. it came from Goof Troop that's so cool 
<laughs> that's very cool. Yeah, no, he was he was super nice. He signed in and he said no one has ever asked me to sign that game. Like that's he's awesome. like I will I will not forget this. And I was like I hope he didn't say that to everyone, but I was like this is really cool. Yeah. And right now he's really thinking about that moment. There you go. Yeah, as, we he is, as we speak. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for listening to the Nintendo Voice Chat. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you're at home listening to this episode, by all means, please check out IGN.com. We will have videos going up of all the stuff that we have right here on the table. And <laughs> hopefully we did a, a decent job. It is, actually. On this table right now, there's a lot of money right here. <laughs> um, I hope we did a good enough job of explaining and giving these you know, items context. Uh, also, right now, just so you're aware, uh, over in San Diego, Comic-Con is in full effect right now. And uh, we've got articles and videos going up on the site. We also have a really cool live stream happening as well with a team of people bringing you really cool interviews, really cool demos from a lot of talented folks in both video games and entertainment. So please make sure that you check that out. Uh, just head over to IGN.com slash Comic-Con, comic-con. Uh, SDCC, anything works. Uh, but, yeah, yeah you can it see out. it on the homepage. And we'll have you know a live demo of Hyrule Warriors oh, and nice. that kind of stuff on. Yep. So you can yeah. see Nintendo games too. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. we just had Bayonetta earlier today. Yep. Bayonetta 2 was really awesome. All right, cool. Uh, also, uh, if you are feeling generous and you would like to leave a review, please head on, head on over to iTunes.com or uh, just find our show on iTunes, excuse me, and leave a review. Let us know what you think of the show. Mike, thank you so much for coming by, man. This was super fun uh, to just walk down both memory lane with you and Pear and also see, like, some really, really cool (laughs) items in history here. That ad, by the way, is amazing. Uh, And we'll have a photo, hopefully, in the show notes of this episode. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you again next week. Bye. Bye.